We have one case for argument this morning, the 90th Minnesota State Senate and the 90th Minnesota State House of Representatives versus the Governor of the State of Minnesota and the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget. The record should reflect that Justice Strauss is recused from participating in this case. Uh, Mr. Hansen, you've reserved 10 minutes for rebuttal. You may proceed when you're ready. May it please the court, counsel, my name is Sam Hansen. I have the privilege of representing in this case Governor Mark Dayton and Commissioner Myron Franz. When the special session of the legislature ended, the governor had an executive decision to make. Although he liked many of the things in the 10 omnibus bills that were presented, there were things he did not agree with. And the question was, how do I continue negotiation with the legislature on those issues with the least disruption of government? His only tool to continue negotiation was his veto power, and, and it offered him three options. The first was he could have vetoed the entire government appropriation bill, but this would be massively disruptive it's what was done in 2011. At that time, 19,000 employees were laid off. He could have vetoed the tax bill. This would be substantially disruptive because the legislature had built into the government appropriations bill a poison pill that if Council, he vetoed it. Can we just get to it? Um, if it's constitutional, as you suggest, for the governor to take away funding for the legislature, why is it constitutional for the judiciary to give the money back to the legislature? First, I would disagree with your premise, Your Honor. The gover governor did not take away funding from the legislature. He vetoed their appropriation knowing that they had funding if, available. If it's constitutional for the governor to veto the legislature's appropriation, why is it constitutional for the judiciary to, in effect, undo that veto by restoring funding, or some funding, to the legislative branch? I think it is not constitutional for the court to restore the funding. I think the court has, uh, if we're addressing the political question, I think there is a political case and a polit political question involved here. This is a political case that comes up in a political environment. The court does have jurisdiction, we believe, to decide whether the veto is authorized by the Constitution. That's something the court has decided in the Johnson case, in the Duxbury case, in the interfaculty case. But we don't believe that the court has jurisdiction to decide why the governor exercised his veto if it determines that it was authorized by the Constitution. But I thought your position was that the remedy here is for the judiciary to make decisions about core funding so that the legislative function can continue. Pending negotiation between the two uh, uh, other branches seeking a political solution, we do believe this court has the judiciary has jurisdiction and to that's, determine. That's what I'm trying to get at with my question. Why is, because that seems to me to be in effect undermining the governor's authority to veto the appropriation because the judiciary is in effect undoing at least some of that. Well, I think the judiciary has done that on several occasions. We've had three government shutdowns over a 10 year period from 2001 to 2011. Well, of course, just because you've done something in the past doesn't make it constitutional. That's what I'm trying to get at here. I mean, what is the constitutional The, the analysis basis? of those cases was based on the uh, uh, reconciling Article 11 of the Constitution, which says you cannot spend money without an appropriation with Articles 4, 5, and 6, which distribute to the executive, judicial, and legislative certain functions that the citizens of Minnesota rely upon them to perform. And the courts have uniformly held different, different judges each case that to reconcile those positions, the, the court has to stand as the safeguard for funding the core functions of each of the branches of government where there is a failure of appropriation. Whether that failure is due to a lack of appropriation by the legislature adjourning the session without an appropriation, 
or as in the 2011 case, whether the a failure of appropriation is due to the governor's veto of the entire uh, government appropriation bill. Council, I want to understand exactly what is and is not before us today. As I understand it, the sole question in the petition for accelerated review was whether the governor's vetoes issued on May 30th were null and void when they were issued. Am I right about that? That's that's the question before so, the court. Sure. Well, but I'm just reading from the joint petition for accelerated review, and it frames the issue, I'm quoting now, whether the governor lawfully exercised his line item veto power when he vetoed the appropriation to the House and to the Senate for the 2018-2019 fiscal biennium, whether he lawfully exercised his line item veto. So my follow-up question then is, is it correct that what the governor did subsequently in deciding not to call a special session or attaching conditions to it, whether that's constitutional or not, is not before the court? I would agree that that is not before the court. And strictly, the strictly speaking, the question of what happens if we determine the governor's veto was constitutional, what happens after that? That would be dealt with on remand, correct? It would be dealt with on remand. So strictly and, speaking, and that's we, not before us today. And we have requested remand to deal with the process of core funding while the negotiation continues. And the reason that the judiciary can, the constitutional reason again, is because three different Ramsey County District Court judges said the judiciary can? I mean, what case law do you have that supports the proposition that the judiciary has the constitutional authority to appropriate money? We do rely on those three cases, but I did call it the law of Ramsey County, and none of them were ever reached <laughs> appellate review. Uh, and so uh, Ramsey County is a fine place, at least it was until the last decision. <laughs> council. So council. council. But, but there is additional authority underpinning it. Uh, the John, the uh, uh, Lyon County case and the Madsen case, although in, in far different contexts, I think uh, confirm that the judiciary, in the absence of, of funding from the funding body, from the appropriating body, the judiciary is the safety valve. The judiciary is the body that steps up to but be sure that in, government but we, continues. But we said in Lyon County that inherent authority, quote, cannot be exercised in the face of the express constitutional provision in, in Article 6, Section 4, that the clerk's salary be controlled by the legislature. So what we said there is if there's an express provision in the Constitution that gives this function to some other branch of government, the judiciary isn't going to step in. I would suggest to you that the Constitution already tells us who has the power to appropriate money, and it's not the judiciary. Clearly not. Uh, but in a circumstance where the legislature who does have that power does not appropriate money, or in a circumstance where the governor who has a participation in appropriation by veto power vetoes, there is, there is a vacuum that if the court doesn't fill, the government doesn't function. Council, I wanna go back to a point that was made by Justice Lillehag. Would you agree that in perhaps a little more simpler terms that but for the fact that the legislature adjourned, we would not be here? I don't think the legislature's adjournment uh, 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 frames this issue before the court now. If the, le if the legislature's adjournment could control the governor's ability to veto, then the legislature would control it, not the governor. So whether the legislature adjourned, whether they by joint resolution adjourned for 10 days to allow the governor to act and then they could consider override, all of those things are possibilities, but I don't think they focus the issue before the court, which focuses on the moment when the governor uh, exercised his veto. The legislature, of course, has an override a remedy in the Constitution. They, de they determined to adjourn sine die. They, they say because they were bound to, if they were bound to by agreement, it was an agreement they made and waived their right to, to continue the legislative session. But we say that agreement was not followed and, and didn't bind them. So either way, we don't think it controls the uh, outcome here. Council, I'd, I'd like to go back to the funding issue, if I might. Uh, one of the concerns that I have, and I think it was raised in respondents' brief, is if rather than 
uh, the judiciary funding on sort of an emergency basis, which is how it arose in the previous government shutdowns, wouldn't we be in some way, shape, or form almost institutionalizing uh, a procedure whereby uh, <clears throat> You, you, you set up a situation whereby on a regular basis or potentially on a regular basis to the extent uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch get into another squabble, that the court is then put in the role. We have put in place by virtue of this decision, if we were to agree with you, um, we have put in place a mechanism that allows on some regular basis potentially um, parties, the, the branches, to come back to the judiciary to resolve those problems. And that concerns me for some of the reasons that the chief has articulated, and I'm wondering what your response to that is. I think the risk of institu institu institutionalization <laughs> is very light. In the history of the state of Minnesota, three times a court has been asked to provide emergency core funding for a branch of the government, sometimes, most, all times, the executive branches, sometimes the judicial branch, sometimes the legislative branch, three times in the whole history. Clearly, things are uh, more controversial now. Maybe the potential of budget impasses is higher. Maybe, again, uh, the court will be asked to step in. But that's the court's function. The court's function is to assure that government continues, and if the other two parties are unable Where to Where in the Constitution does it say that the judiciary is charged with ensuring that government continues? I think the distribution uh, uh, in Articles 4, 5, and 6 of duties and responsibilities to the executive, legislative, and judicial is a, is a uh, set of duties that are enforceable by the court. They're duties that are for the benefit of citizens. Citizens have a right to a functioning government. And if the government is incapable of functioning because of a lack of appropriation, then it's the court's function, I believe, to step in and, and to assure that citizens' rights are protected. Isn't that contrary? Isn't the authority that you would give to the judicial branch contrary to the very foundation of our democracy? I mean, you, you quote the Federalist Papers in some of, the, some of your briefing. And in the Federalist Papers, the judiciary is described as the least dangerous branch because the judiciary doesn't have the, the power of the purse. Your argument now means, in effect, that the judiciary has the power of the purse. And you're seeking to really <clears throat> elevate, so we've got three co-equal branches of government, and you're seeking, aren't you, to elevate the judiciary above the other two? I think not. The court only acts, acts when asked to act. It can't initiate, obviously. I think really telling are the cases coming out of the, out of the United States Supreme Court and the federal courts. Let's assume that a legislature does not fund public education. The federal courts have said, we don't care if you don't have an appropriation. You have a constitutional obligation to fund public education. And if necessary, the court will be called upon to step in. That, that is the, the court of last resort. It's not something that the court is going to be asked to do often, but if the other branches of government do not fund a critical core function of government, do you, would the courts stand by and let that function disappear? And counsel, would you say no public education? Would you say no executive uh, branch? Uh, well, I think not. Remedy, I think the court the, would step in. Counsel, isn't the remedy in that scenario to say to the branch of government that is trying to prevent the functioning of another branch of government, no, you can't do that. Your veto is null and void. Isn't that the remedy? Isn't that a less dangerous remedy in terms of, of, of making sure that the branches stay in a co-equal way well, instead of elevating one above the other? I think you have to go back then to why a veto power exists and whether that uh, uh, treatment of a veto power would so erode it that it no longer exists. Under your Duxbury case, you spelled out the history and the purpose of a veto power, and you said there is a tendency in free societies for the legislature to occupy all of government. And therefore, we're going to give to the governor a veto power uh, as a legislative power, an intrusion into the legislative process, a negative one, not an affirmative one, but for the purpose of creating balance of powers. When the legislature oversteps, the governor has the veto power, 
to step in and use it. Council, let, let, let's actually get to that in, in, in terms of the claim that's actually in front of us, which is the count one in the declaratory judgment uh, claim. The legislature here claims that, that the line item veto violates the distributive clause of Article 3 uh, because the veto effectively abolished the legislature, and they cite Ma Madison to us. Um, can you talk with me a little bit about Madison and why that does not support um, what the legislature's claim is? Because as I understand their claim is that, well, there's, there's three equal branches, the three equal branches that are in Article, Article 3, right. and when you abolish or functionally abolish, because the legislature's still there, obviously, but when you functionally abolish uh, one of those branches, you've now encroached upon, <coughs> uh, impermissibly encroached upon Article 3. I think the rhetoric. I think the rhetoric is over the top using the word abolish because that clearly hasn't happened. Madsen involved a permanent decision made by the legislature to eliminate functions of a constitutional officer. It wasn't an invitation to come and negotiate and see if we can resolve this politically. It was a permanent uh, uh, change and reduction of the functions of a constitutional office. This court said you cannot do that. It was a function case, not particularly a funding case, but the court did uh, reinstate the appropriations that had been shifted from that constitutional office. In this case, there, there, is not a, there is no permanent denial even of appropriations. There's an denial of veto of appropriations in order to invite the legislature to come back How do we know session. it's not permanent? Why do you say it's not permanent? Well, at least three re reasons. There is funding available to the uh, legislature pending these negotiations with the governor, uh, but, but there was no indication that the denial of an appropriation would be permanent. It was instead an invitation to come back to negotiate. Those negotiations, if successful, would obviously have included approving an appropriation. The governor said, your work is not done. I'm not going to approve your Council, appropriation how can, now. How can one side participate in negotiations without funding to pay legislator salaries and staff salaries and, and attorney fees? I mean, we can look around the room here and think about what the taxpayers are paying for this case. But how can they meaningfully participate when they don't have funding? They do have funding. They have $25 million of carryover funding, which no other branch of government has. So they have that immediately available. They have the remedy of going into the Ramsey County District Court and asking for funding for their core functions, which includes, obviously, salaries. So your argument really does depend, the success of your argument really does depend on the conclusion that the judiciary has the constitutional authority to appropriate money. I think it does, or stated the other way, I think the legislature's argument depends on the false premise that they have been abolished, and Council, they have not been abolished. Council, I have a question that's a little more um, general in that uh, have the parties engaged in any settlement discussions, either through Council or through the assistance of a third party mediator since the issuing of the district court order? Count, I, I think I'm, I'm only thinking what's in the record before the court, and I think in the record before the court, particularly the stipulations that Council have been able to reach, we came to the conclusion and we stated to the district court that as long as this issue of the legality of the veto is an open issue, there is no incentive, particularly on the side of the legislature, to come to a meeting to discuss. And the so governor did call a meeting, but if the legislature believes that they are entitled to their appropriation, then there is nothing uh, uh, to, to offer them to get concessions on the issues that he wants to negotiate. And so once this one question is answered, perhaps then it will lead the parties back to working on the issues before them. Our view that a, is that a, view, a ruling on this issue, and particularly a ruling that the governor's veto is lawful and enforceable, would cause the parties to have incentives to get back and have discussion on the issues that they disagree upon. I, I'd like to move to an issue that has been, it's, it appears to be a secondary issue. I'm not sure it's a secondary issue. Uh, and that's this question about the governor's veto itself and the discussion in the briefing about object to versus veto, the 74 constitutional amendment and so forth. This is an unusual veto in the sense that 
I think if you go back and look at line item vetoes, it's pretty clear what various governors have done. They've, they have ve line item vetoed various matters because they didn't want to spend the money. Uh, here, it's, it's clear that there are other uh, issues at work here, and I'm wondering if we all agree that the 1974 amendment um, was not designed, the 1974 approval by the voters, was not to, designed to change prior understandings of the Constitution, why then isn't the, uh, isn't the legislature correct that this is not a formal objection to a particular appropriation? It, it's something else. It's, it's um, we can argue about what that is, but it's something other than an objection. I think the uh, act of objecting is the same as the act of vetoing. In other words, I disagree with this. I'm objecting to it, I'm vetoing it. The governor did disagree with uh, their appropriation because he said, we have these remaining issues and you, your work is not done. It's premature to approve your appropriation because there's further work to be done. More importantly though, I think what put the governor in this position, which is something I was trying to reach at the very beginning, if he couldn't veto the tax bill to raise his issues with the tax bill because that would uh, deny the appropriation to the revenue department, 1,300 employees, substantially disruptive of government, his only other veto possibility to call the legislature back into session was to use the line item veto. That affected 638 employees, less employees, the legislature was not in session, it was the least disruptive solution to this executive question that he Why was Why does any of that facing. matter? I mean, I thought your position was we couldn't inquire into the governor's mind. We couldn't inquire into why he did what he did. So, I'm, so why does it matter then, I guess is what I'm asking you. Because I think uh, in many respects, the, the legislature caused the situation that they complain about. By putting the poison pill, attempting to limit the veto power they restricted the governor's options, and then they claim the option he chose was a bad option. Council, let it, me ask you um, a question about the impact of the rule of law that you're advocating here. Um, if we agree with you that the governor's uh, authority to line item veto the appropriation is as you suggest, um, then what's to stop a future governor or future legislature from entirely defunding the judicial branch of government? The powers that the governor uh, uh, asserted here were powers that he's had for over 100 years in that office. Your ruling that the governor's veto is legal is simply an interpretation of the Constitution and the express words of the Constitution, which provides no limitation, no disqualification. If it's an item of appropriation, he's entitled to veto it. The governor had that right for 100 years, the governor has that right now. Your decision will not expand that right. On the other hand, if you say his veto was unlawful, then the legislature has acquired to itself the ability to control the veto by putting conditional appropriations, poison pills into legislation, into appropriations, limiting the governor's ability uh, to do a direct veto, an executive veto of an entire bill because he has to pay this enormous price to do it, and yet not being able to fall back on the line item veto. So I, I think the consequences of this case, if you find the veto was, was legal, you haven't changed the law that existed since 1876. Well, counsel, the, the chief's hypothetical, and it is a hypothetical, also would assume that the legislature wouldn't be in session and that the governor would veto the judiciary's appropriation entirely and then never call back the legislature in a special session. Well, I mean, in fact, that could assuming have, extraordinary bad that, faith. That could have happened here. I mean, Excuse the judiciary's me. budget wasn't signed until after the legislature had adjourned sine die. That, that could, I mean, that, that, that could have happened here. And I'm just wondering what the answer to my question is in your view. If, if we rule in your favor, doesn't that mean that some future gov governor could defund the judiciary, or that some future legislature could defund the judiciary? They couldn't defund because the court has the ability, 
again, provide so core funding. We're back to that again. So, so defunding, I think, is an improper word that has been used throughout this case, and there is no defunding. Funding is available. The governor can, can uh, veto an appropriation, which is not the same as funding. It, funding can come from an appropriation, but it doesn't have to. This Our governor, as, if you look at history, this governor has been very judicious in the use of the line item veto. He's used it 12 times. His predecessors, who had two terms in office, have used it over 200 times. Has any governor in the history of the state of Minnesota ever line item vetoed the entire appropriation for another branch of government? <clears throat> Uh, I, I can't think of a case, I mean, they line item veto, but partly that's due to the fact that the legislature puts in its entire budget in one line. The governor couldn't line item parts of the legislative budget because it only shows as one line, as opposed to the executive, where the budget shows as many lines and the governors, governors have vetoed individual lines of, of those items. So I, I again, it, it, the problem is, you, is largely the, the legislature's own have, doing. In the 10 seconds you have left, I do have one other question I wanna ask you, and that is, um, I share your concern about the, um, the poison pill that the legislature used here. Um, that is something we haven't, at least in context of these proceedings, haven't seen before. But is that issue actually before us? It isn't before you directly in the sense that by the, by the governor signing the tax bill, he mooted out whatever objection there could have been to the poison pill. It's in front of you indirectly though, I would say in this sense. If you rule that the governor could not, because he can't veto the tax bill, could not use his line item veto as a way of calling the legislature back into session, then you have added your imprimatur to the poison pill because the poison pill has caused it. I think it's quite relevant. A very narrow decision you could make is because, the, because of the poison pill, the governor was prevented from vetoing the substantive bill and therefore under at least those circumstances had the authority to use the line item veto to get the negotiations back with the legislature. Mr. Hansen, just don't leave for a minute. I just want to make sure my colleagues, there, isn't, there are no other. Yes, I actually have one. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hansen, I'm, I'm concerned about kind of a related issue, which also is maybe not directly raised by the parties. And that is, even if we, let's assume for argument, for the sake of argument, we were to agree with you that the line item veto, veto did not violate either Article 3 or Article 4. Is there a sense possibly in which it was nevertheless a constitutional violation because of the manner in which the governor chose to exercise that veto? In other words, saying, I will call a special session, but only if you will agree to either come back, to come back and negotiate or in, in the actual, uh, one of the May 30th letters, the governor says, if you will in fact take out or amend certain provisions of various bills, including the tax bill. Is there an argument, because I sense that that's a part of what, what your opponents are saying, is that the governor does not have the authority to, uh, to make laws, uh, to enact laws, only the legislature has that authority. And so even if the veto itself is constitutional, is there possibly an argument that the manner in which he exercised it was unconstitutional. Does that make sense? I don't think there is, Your Honor. Uh, from this perspective, it would put the court right in the middle of the negotiating tactics of both parties. I've been involved in millions of, well, not millions, thousands of negotiations. <laughs> the party who takes the initiative makes the proposal, and they make a strong proposal. The other party makes a counter proposal. Somewhere in between is where negotiations settle. The fact that the governor made a strong proposal to invite these negotiations is a negotiating step. It's certainly not the concluding step. Is he step. inviting negotiations when he says, um, and I forget the wording of the May 30th letter, and I will call a special session, but only if you will change, or words to that effect. I, I can't tell you the number of times that a plaintiff has said to me, I will not take a penny less than a million dollars to settle this case that's settled for a half a million dollars. 
Of course you take the strongest position you can. Well, but the problem, Mr. Hansen, is that only the governor can call a special session. I mean, the legislature can't call itself back into special session. The governor has two tools to allow him to influence legislation, the veto power and the ability to call a special session. Those are tools given to him by the Constitution. Can I, can I? Sure. And <laughs> counsel, would you agree that if the legislature had not adjourned, and the governor had used his line item veto, those conversations would have continued. Because would, it would have went back to the legislature, they still would have been in session. If they, if they had not adjourned sign a die, if they had by joint resolution adjourned for 10 days and then had a chance to address the veto, they could have attempted to override the veto. Right. Uh, failing that, uh, yes, I think the negotiations would have continued in the history of this state, budget impasses have lasted at the longest, 2011, 20 Why doesn't days. the governor then just call them back into special session today? Pardon? Why doesn't the governor just call them back into special session? No conditions, just call them back. <clears throat> well, he called them back for one special session without a commitment to exactly what's going to be in the bills. And the result of that was not uh, very favorable. Things were put into the bills that, that were beyond uh, the conceptual agreement. And somehow it's better for all of us to be here today having this argument. That was rhetorical. Think, you don't geez. have to answer that. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Justice Judge. Well, it's hard, hard to jump in here. I, I want to go to the separation of powers clause itself. And I understand your argument. The separation of powers clause has an exception in it for it says instances expressly provided in this Constitution. And I understand the argument that Article 4, Section 23 gives the governor the line item veto power, which is a legislative power. It's a negative one. Exactly. It's a legislative power. And that, um, therefore, Section 23 carves out an exception to the prohibitive clause of the separation of powers provision. But when I look at the plain language of Article 3, that exception clause is located at the end of the sentence containing the prohibitive clause. And then there's the bedrock principle that our government consists of three separate departments. I don't think that the limited legislative power granted to the governor in Section 23 carves out an exception to the distributed Clause. Are you following me so far? I, I follow you. And, okay. and, my, and do you agree with that, first of all? I don't. And this court has already decided that issue, albeit not in this context. But my favorite case, the old case of State versus Bates, talks of, dissects the uh, separation of powers clause. And it says it has three different parts, distributive, prohibitive, and exception. And if you fit within the exception, then you're not prohibited. That's exactly what the governor's veto uh, was no, intended and, and, to be. And I agree with that part, but what I'm saying, does the exception part also pertain to the distributive part of it, that the government shall have three departments? Because I don't see how it does, either just by the language and just by the overarching principle that our government has three departments. Uh, I'm, so I, I'm, just, I'm afraid I didn't, I didn't get the nuance of your question. So I'm wondering if the exception clause, you said there's three clauses. I'm wondering if the exception clause carves out exceptions. I say it does to the prohibit, uh, prohibitive, uh, but does it to the... Uh, I understand. Okay. No, I don't, th I don't think it, I think it does apply to the prohibited. In other words, You've been given certain powers. You're prohibited from exercising powers given to another branch unless you fall within the exception. The exception doesn't reduce your distributed powers. It affects the legislative's distributed powers because it, it gives some legislative power to the governor. The, the veto does as an exception. But I guess what I'm, I'm still looking for is if you set aside the possibility of judicial funding, um, are there other reasons why the veto doesn't violate the distributive clause? None that occur to me, no. Well, I think you've made some before that it, like, unlike Matson, this is not a permanent one. Um, the legislature itself, if it can survive huh. until February, will come back and it can renew its appropriations and it can maybe even retroactively pay itself. I don't know. 
But I, it seems to me there are other reasons besides judicial funding that this veto uh, may not violate the distributive clause. Uh, I understand, and I and I agree. I, I think the, the well, legislature. What does the record show about when the funding runs out? The uh, two affidavits of the House and, and Senate uh, personnel would suggest, absent the agreement that Council reached for a stipulation for funding pending this appeal. Well, that runs out October first. I'm sorry. The, the the district court's temporary order runs out. That money runs out October first. It runs out or on a pending order of arc, whichever occurs earlier, but the latest it would would be would be October first. Yes, and then uh, the uh, uh, affidavits suggest that the House has about four months at their normal spending level of carryover funds. The Senate has something more than a month of carryover funds. In the meantime, our remedy suggestion is that they would be back before the court but to so get let me court just funding. Let, let me just make sure I do the math correctly then and you help me here. So if the court order runs out October 1st and you're saying that the House has the most, they have four months. So that would be October, November, December, January. So that at the end of January, barring some agreement or some <laughs> other court order, there is no money for the legislature. I'm not sure that they would use their money in the uh, at their normal monthly spend level, so they could per perhaps make it last longer. But yes, I think theoretically, okay, that would be absent a court order providing critical core funding, uh, they would run out of money, okay. or absent, preferably, a political solution to the disagreements that included a restoration of their appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Thank you. You have 10 minutes uh, for rebuttal. <coughs> Mr. Kelly. May it please the court. <clears throat> Council, my name is Doug Kelly. I'm, I am here representing today the 90th uh, Minnesota State Senate and the 90th Minnesota State House of Representatives. I represent all the members of the legislature. So can I ask you the question that I asked opposing counsel is, do you agree that until this question, the question, the single question is answered, that you're unable to move forward with any negotiations or settlement discussions or seeking the assistance of a third party neutral? Yes, Your Honor. I think uh, the, the, we are at an impasse, and both of us said that at the lower court. We need this court to break the impasse for us, and uh, I think uh, negotiations in the interim would not be uh, fruitful. And so no efforts have been made, just so I'm clear. That's correct. Council, just as a preliminary matter before you get going, are there, do you agree that um, any factual differences that may exist are not material to the legal issues we're deciding? Um, I think the only issues that I think pertain, and we put these in our statement of the facts, Your Honor, are, have to do with this whole business of adjournment, sine die. And I think Mr. Hansen, my opponent today, said uh, again that we bargained that away and that we broke the agreement somehow that we had uh, with the governor. And uh, that would be contrary to the findings of fact um, that Judge Guthman did. Judge Guthman took a look at the agreement for the special session. And so the, the literal wording of the agreement says that it would run out on Wednesday morning at seven o'clock. They didn't have their bills done by then, so it had to go longer. What Judge Guthman said was the agreement was, and this is his finding, um, that uh, the, the legislature would adjourn after they delivered the bills to the governor. So that is one of the few facts that we disagree on. I don't think there's any way that you can say the legislature broke the agreement, and there's certainly nothing in the record to say that the governor said, whoops, on Thursday morning, uh, the agreement's off, we're all backing away from the agreement. But counsel, didn't, <clears throat> didn't Judge Guthman say, and I don't remember the precise finding of fact, that the legislature negotiated away its right vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, adjournment. 
Well, that part is true, and, the, and I think, Your Honor, that's what happens at the end of almost every special session that, that I am aware of, and that is the governor wants to make sure that the legislature doesn't just have a freewheeling time when he's there, so he wants the, so you present the bills that we have agreed on. Those bills were enumerated in that special session letter, uh, which is part of the record, and you present those bills to the governor, and then you adjourn sine die, Council. and that's, that's the way it's happened. But, for but, 30 but counsel, years. But counsel, it seemed to me that they, correct me if I'm wrong on the facts, the legislature adjourned promptly on May 25th after they approved the uh, appropriation bill. <coughs> Had they waited until after the governor acted on the special session bill, which he did on May 30th, wouldn't they, they still would have been in session, right? Correct. Um, so they would have been in session when the governor actually vetoed the appropriation. And therefore, they could have either overridden that veto, presuming, assuming they had the votes to do so, or presented a new bill, a new bill. So why shouldn't, where, where does that fall? Where does that, if I have that scenario correct, where does that fall, and why shouldn't we just leave the whole thing alone? They negotiated away, in essence. Uh, their right to exercise the, the mechanism that the Constitution gives them. Well, both sides negotiate as part of that. So the governor wants to make sure there are limits on what he calls them back into special session, and that's why there are the, uh, the seven things that are in the, in the bill here. You can only bring these up. You can't take amendments. You can't do any of these other things. And when you're done, you, you give us the bills that we've agreed on, and you sign, and then you adjourn. Now, that, that's the way these agreements have been done for the last 30 years. If you go back and look at the Legislative Reference Library, you will find but that's counsel, the case. But, Council, I think case. the point is there was nothing preventing the legislature from staying um, in session. I think that's the point that we've been trying to get clarified is there is nothing preventing them from staying in session. It's just that perhaps in the past they have adjourned promptly, um, but there was nothing preventing them from, from staying in session and waiting until the governor had made a decision on those bills. Other than their agreement. Except for that agreement was for one day and they went past the one day, so there were, and no one objected to that, but their, their original agreement was for one day, correct? Yes. And what, what Judge Guthman said was they, the, the agreement was that they would adjourn after they passed the bills, which is different than saying you can break the contract and, and go back on it. I think the governor would have screamed bloody murder if they had stayed in session, taken up other matters, and done other things. He would have called them a runaway legislature. They fulfilled their obligation with the governor pursuant to this agreement. And I, I think that that shows that, um, you know, the, the problem we have here is that this is, this is not an accident that we're here. Council, before you pivot away from the adjournment point, okay. um, Judge Guthman did indeed make the finding of fact, which was finding number eight, that the legislature negotiated away its constitutional right to meet in session to consider overriding vetoes or line item vetoes. Now your clients at page six of your brief say that they chose, and you put the word chose in italics, to adjourn rather than wait for vetoes. So why should the judicial branch actively intervene to undo the effects of the constitutional choice your clients made? And their choice is constitutionally protected. It is textually committed in our Constitution that they can adjourn whenever they want to. So why, why should we intervene actively? Well, the, they are, have upheld their agreement, and that is an agreement let's that they, has let's, gone... Let's assume they upheld the agreement. They did exactly as they negotiated. And, and so there, therefore, um, we are stuck in this position. And let, let, let me just say, with regard to this, that we're not here by accident today. We are here because of an engineered situation by the executive branch, and he used two provisions uh, that we've talked about. One is the line item veto, veto the entire appropriation. Also, that I, happens think, I afterwards. think you need to be careful in ascribing motives, because there's, there's plenty of motive discussion that can be had here about either branch of government, it seems to me. 
I mean, if you're going to go down the motive road, then we got to go down the poison pill road, is what I'm suggesting. Well, let me let me just what I'm suggesting here, Your Honor, is there's the interaction of two things: one, veto the entire thing after they have adjourned, and then number two, do not call them back into special session. And that's a power that comes out of Article Four, Section Twelve, that the, the governor has the power to call them back. And what, why that is unique in the history of this state is because my client does not have the ability to save itself. Um, and as Judge Guthman said, they are in essence without a remedy and uh, that's why we had to come to this court and that's why you should step in to break this impasse. My clients have both hands tied behind their back and they cannot defend themselves counsel, as we go forward. Counsel, let's make sure we again understand as I took Mr. Hansen through exactly what's before us today. The only question before us is the validity of the veto. Am I right about that? Correct. There is no argument in the, no allegation in your complaint or in the petition for review that the governor has acted unconstitutionally in not calling the legislature back into special session. That's not there, is it? It, it, it is by implication. And that is because if you use proper tools, and listen, the, the, the line item veto is a constitutional proper tool that the governor can use. Calling into special session is a proper tool the governor can use. But the way he has done it here, he has rendered one branch inoperative and unable okay. to defend themselves. So let's, let's change the facts a little bit. Let's say the legislature, everybody who's getting their work done early in the session, and the legislature passes an appropriation for itself. The governor line item vetoes that appropriation. And the legislature is in session, can't override the veto if it's got the votes. Is that line item veto unconstitutional? That's a very hard hypothetical, and one which we have talked about, Your Honor. Um, luckily, we don't have to draw a line like that because that's not what's happened here. But listen, I believe that if there, if the, so if what you, do you think if the answer you, is? If you use a veto, <laughs> Your Honor, if you use that veto and it has the effect of abolishing another branch. You can't abolish another branch. I think that's one principle. But, but how Council, do you get, how do you get close you to that? Aren't you engaging in a little bit of hyperbole? I mean, the legislature is not abolished. I mean, only a, con a branch of government can only be abolished by constitutional amendment. That certainly hasn't happened. And as Mr. Hansen indicated, there's at least some amount of carryover funding. There's uh, some funding to the Legislative Commission, um, and in fact, the legislature has been running at least since the start of the new biennium. And so it's not abolished. I guess I wanna, want us to be careful about how we use that terminology because it, it still exists, right? Your Honor, I am using the terminology that Judge Guthman said. He said they effectively abolished the legislature by his veto. Well, but veto. we're here that, now, that's my, Okay. That, that isn't something I made up. That's the judge's language. However you want to render, he obliterated us. We, they, have the, they are inoperative. Whatever word we decide to use, um, they cannot function as a result. Now, let me let me go on to a little different um, uh, question here. It's maybe a little different version of the question that Justice Lillehog asked you, and that is this. Um, there are lots of concerns about what the implications of this are, but there is also the matter of the plain language of the Constitution, and I think the subtext of the question that Justice Lillehog asked you is, if you look to the subtext of the Constitution in terms of when the governor can exercise his uh, line item veto, has to be for an appropriation item. He did that here. Um, even if the implications of this decision are ruinous um, or disastrous or whatever you may want to su suggest, what do we do about that plain language argument? You're talking about the object to language in the 1876 amendment. Right, well that, that's a piece of this, but you know, we, we've, got a, we've got this decision, I mean, we've got the action of the governor, he, he line itemed an appropriation, the, the, the Constitution seems to permit that by its plain language. What do we do about that? Well, a couple of, couple of things here. Number one, the object to language that comes right out of the 1876 amendment um, that allowed the line item veto says you have to object to the uh, specific item of appropriation. And um, I think if you look at that and you see how 
other courts have interpreted those things. You, there's a, no other way to interpret it than you can, you've got to object to the, the appropriation itself. Counsel, let's say you lose that part of the argument. Then what, then how do you address the question posed by Justice Anderson? Which question then? Meaning, meaning that your argument that object is different than veto. Let's assume for the purposes of his question that they are one and the same. Well, listen, number one, I think that our case is very simple, straightforward in the earliest part, which goes to Justice Lillehog's question as well. If you abolish, render ineffective, whatever you do, that's a violation of the separation of powers. Second of all, if you use permissible tools, but you use them to get an impermissible result or you get an unconstitutional result, then it can also be violative. Counsel, let me, let me come at it maybe a different way. And this is a plain language question as well, and I think it's, it's uh, an elaboration of Justice Anderson's question. But as I read Article 4, Section 23, there's only one limitation that's in there with respect to the governor's line item veto, and that is that the veto be made as to an item of appropriation. There's no dispute, is there, that this was an item of appropriation. The, the, the legislature's budget was an item of, of appropriation. So if that's true, then what language is there in the plain language of Article 4, Section 23 that says the governor can exercise that line item veto over any approach, appropriation except an appropriation for the legislature? Because I don't see that language. Well, it doesn't occur right there in that language, which we have to do is go back the, to the- Isn't that the end of the analysis? It doesn't occur there. No, it isn't, Your Honor. And Why I think not? you have to go back to that? the jurisprudence that we have cited in our brief that talks about the line item veto. And by the way, the line item veto and the general veto are very different powers. And the line item veto is, a, is to be narrowly construed. Um, and this court in Brayton said that the legislature has the primary responsibility to establish the spending priorities, and the governor has a limited defined role in the budget process. Since, uh, also in interfaculty, the cases, case law says, hey, if, since it comes out and it's a, it takes away from the legislative prerogative, it must be very narrowly construed. It's a negative authority, it's not a creative one, and it can't be used to, buy, to do policy. And I grant so you we, all of that, what, Mr. Kelly. I, I agree with your, with your statement, but I still don't see why, if, if all Article 4, Section 3 calls for is that the veto be of an item of appropriation, why isn't what the governor did vetoing an item of appropriation? He did and that's veto a narrow an item. rule. He did veto an item of appropriation, Your Honor, but he did it for an impermissible purpose. First of but all, but Johnson versus Carlson says we don't look behind uh, the, we don't look at the motive, we don't look at the purpose. Just like it would be inappropriate for this court to look at the purposes behind what the legislature does. That case law is legion, and and Johnson versus Carlson makes that very clear that that we don't go that next step. That it's impermissible for this body to do that. Judge Guthman addressed this very specific question, and he found that that, that the separation of powers clause applies, um, and under Starkweather, a uh, case that we have cited, both sides have cited in our brief, once you find that there is an improper purpose, and the judge found that there were two things here. He said it was an improper use of the line item veto. He said it was trying to make it into a backdoor policy veto, by what the manner that he's done here. In other words, you can't, you can't use the line item veto to veto an uh, item of policy, and my counsel has uh, agreed with that proposition. What the governor has done here is to say, uh, you, you have to remember the governor twice put in his budget appropriations, which are exactly the same um, that, were, that he ended up vetoing. And what he says in his letter is, uh, I, you know, I, I want you to come back and negotiate, and so I want you to talk about these five items of policy. Judge Guthman found that's wrong. You're using the line item veto to really leverage yourself into policy, and that's Counsel, impermissible. Counsel, I'm, I'm missing the distinction that you're drawing here between a general veto and a line item veto, and in that regard, let me ask you this. I, I watched your argument in the district court and in that argument, I think you conceded the governor could have vetoed the entirety of SF-1, the, the state government appropriations bill, 
Now that also would have zeroed out the legislature because the legislature was in SF1. Correct. So <clears throat> what's your rule of law that you're proposing that it would be constitutional to veto the whole thing, including zeroing out the legislature, but unconstitutional to line item veto the legislature? It, it the, net, the net effect is the same, isn't it? And he could have added the same five conditions for calling a special session. It's very different, and let me explain why. When you veto the bill, you veto the whole bill, both sides lose what they had in the bill. They were compromised. Governor had things he wanted. Uh, the legislature had things it's wanted. And you veto it, you're back to square one. Okay, what do we do? Yeah, and they negotiate in the political process to get it. When you have a line item veto, the line item veto takes one item out and the rest becomes law. And so you are really, the line item veto is, is, is very pernicious in that way. It's almost, you can make You're law You're just saying it's, it's just way. not fair, it's dirty pool? Well, it, it, what I'm saying is it's different than this because you, you do not go back to how, the political how process. How legally is it different? Is there anything in the Constitution that says you can do it in a general veto, but you can't do it in a line item veto. Especially when yes. it's the same result. Yes, there are many things you but, can't do counsel, in a line item veto. Excuse but it's me, the same Honor. result because you've been you've been articulating using the district court's language that the line item veto abolished the legislature. Given the um, uh, question by Justice Lillehog, it's the same result. So no, it's not the same result, Your Honor, because of the manner in which it's involved in the political process. If you, if he, had, if the governor had vetoed it, we would not be here today. I believe if the governor vetoes that bill, they have to go back and they have to come to some kind of an agreement, and I believe they would have. But under the way that this was done, after it was done and without the ability to come back into a special session, now this is law and my clients have no ability to defend themselves as they would have if there had been a general veto. Or if they had remained in session. If they hadn't given up and made an agreement with the governor that they kept, Your Honor. Let me, let me go back to um, the qu a question that I think I'm going back to a question that Justice Lillehog asked you that I don't think you answered largely because everybody else jumped on you. Um, so l let, me, let me ask you this. If, the, if, all, if this line item veto of the legislature were to occur while the legislature's in session, in other words, there's talk every year, it never happens, but there's talk every year, we're going to get the appropriations done early, uh, and then it never happens. But let's say, let's say magic occurs and it happens early. Uh, and the governor then line items the uh, legislature because he's just, uh, he just thinks this is the thing to do. Is that constitutional? Yes, because then you could go back and then the, the legislature would have the opportunity to try to override the bill um, and we would be in the middle of the usual political process. The and uniqueness of this case is my clients uh, can't do anything about the situation they're in now except come to and you. Now we're down, and now we're down to the nub of it. It seems to me that, the, that your client's argument is not with the validity of the veto itself, no. but with the, with the governor's right to call the legislature back into special session or not. And I don't see anything in the complaint, and we certainly didn't grant review on this, where you're claiming that the governor's discretion to call or not call a special session is being abused here. So aren't you essentially conceding that the veto is valid? And that the real problem is your client doesn't have a remedy because it negotiated it away? No. And um, the problem is, there is this the unique situation where we can't do anything to defend ourselves. And, and I think it's, it, it is... Um, Does your client want out of the agreement? No, my client, my client lived up to its agreement with the governor. Is there anything in the agreement where the governor committed not to veto anything? No, but... The, so the, the, the legislature the, knew he could veto things? Well, listen, I, I, I think over the course of time here with different things have happened, but the agreement, Your Honor, is here are the bills that we agree on. We cut this deal, okay? All these bills, and we've all looked at them. Some of the things the governor wants in are not there. Some of the things my clients want are not there, but there's this compromise. And they cut the deal, and then the, the, the agreement, the special session agreement says, come in, 
no amendments, no thing, you can't do anything else. You're gonna pass these bills and the assumption is the governor will sign them the, and he will not veto them. The assumption was that he was gonna sign them. Is there anything in the agreement or is there anything in the record where the governor committed to sign each and every one of those bills? He not only line item vetoed the legislative line, he vetoed the labor standards bill. Yep. Was there was there anything in the agreement that he was going to sign the labor standards bill? Nothing in the in anything the in the agreement the that he agreement. was not going to line item anything. Nothing in the wording of the agreement, Your Honor, other than I believe the understanding that the 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 thrust of the deal will be held. Um. <clears throat> Council, may I ask just a factual question? Did the if you know? The governor did not see the general appropriation bill as with the other bills until May 25th, is that correct? I believe that's correct, Your Honor. So he would, have, he would not have known until May 25th that that poison pill was in there, correct? I don't think that's a correct, I believe that that, that provision was in several parts of the bill before that, several iterations that had come, but I, I am not, I'm not well, that, is it fair to say, that. though, that, that, that the final bill that he actually saw, that he knew was going to be the bill, the first time he saw that bill that definitively included the poison pill would have been on May 25th? Yes, uh, I agree with that. So, in a way, and it goes to Justice Lillehog's question, the, this situation is a little bit of the legislature's own making, isn't it, in that you drop in this poison pill and, and then hope and pray that the governor will be consigned and resigned to, to sign it. I'm presuming that the, the extensive staff the governor has, the Department of Revenue has, and everybody else, that they clearly and quickly saw that that provision was there, and the governor had a very easy remedy. Just veto it. Wow. Veto that, veto that, and then we're back in the political process and everybody has the opportunity to come at it But had to, he done that, the Department of Revenue would have been defunded. Pardon me? Had he done that, well, listen, he, he could have done that or he could have signed the bill. He could have come to court here and said that's not an appropriate thing and uh, I'm coming to the court to save the Department of Revenue and I want core functions. And the governor addressed that in his letter, which we haven't talked about core functions here, but uh, in his letter, the governor said, I didn't want to risk going to court because of the, I guess, the I guess, Council, members what's, of the Department of Revenue. What's troubling me a little bit is throughout your brief and throughout um, the complaint uh, in count one, the declaratory judgment uh, part of the complaint, there's language about the governor coercing the, uh, the legislature and abolishing the legislature to coerce it into repealing policy legislation. and. Uh, using the line item veto to control, coerce, restrain the actions of the legislature in the exercise of its constitutional powers and duties. And what just strikes me as odd here is that isn't that exactly what the legislature did by including the poison pill? It, it was an attempt to control, coerce, restrain the action of the executive branch in the exercise of its constitutional powers. Uh, but it didn't. And, and listen, the governor had a remedy, and I don't want to sound repetitive, but all he had to do was veto it, and we'd be back into the political process and things could go on. Um, veto, so, so he had veto Veto it. that bill or, or sign it and come to court and come and say, hey, uh, so you, that you poison pill was wrong. could have vetoed the appropriations bill is what you're saying. And, and I said in, in the conclusion of my brief, listen, we're used to some sharp elbows in the political process here. That, that's been part of our recent uh, legislative history here in terms of the way we deal with it. And there are certain tools that can be used, and one of them, the tool, the power of the veto, um, if that had happened, we would have been back in session, and uh, but, but I, I think things would have... But isn't one of his other tools we, in the toolbox is the line item veto. That is also a tool in the governor's it, toolbox, and the legislature does not get to control which tool he uses. If you look at the history of how the line item veto came. That's why we put a section in our brief about, you know, going back to the Magna Carta and all of those things, Your Honor, you will see that the line item veto is a very different animal than the general veto power is. And it can only be used in certain ways. And this court has said certain restrictions that come 
on Can that line. Can I ask, that's why I asked you, what is the language in Article 4 or Article 3, for that matter, that puts any limits on other than the constitutional test, so-called, which is that it be an item of appropriation. Other than that, point me to the language in either one of those articles that puts any limits on that line item veto. And I would, I would redirect the court back to the case law, which we cited in our brief, which says there are many limitations on a line item veto. And it doesn't, those, those decisions, that's the law of, of this court here, that the line item veto is to be narrowly construed, can't be used for policy, and so forth. Council, um, if we hold that the governor can't use his line item veto to, over appropriations to the legislature, doesn't that actually un risk an imbalance to the, to the principle of co-equal branches of government because it would give the legislature absolute authority over its budget? Listen, I, I, I think there are circumstances, and Judge Guthman found that there are circumstances where you can line item veto the legislature's budget. Let's say it happened in Montana. The legislature came in, uh, gave themselves a 15% increase in their budget, vetoed, and everybody talked about it. Uh, you know, but it went back into the political process, and that's true. What you can't do is abolish another branch of government, which is what Judge Guthman found occurred here. So I know that I'm, I am out Let of time. Let me just make sure we're, everybody's got their questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hansen, you have 10 minutes for rebuttal. And while you're making your way up here, I want you to ponder this question. If, in your view, the judiciary has the constitutional authority to appropriate money, do we also have the constitutional authority to direct the governor to call the legislature into a special session without any conditions? Again, uh, Your Honor, I have to disagree with your premise. I, I don't believe they have constitutional authority to appropriate money. Appropriation is one thing, funding is another. Fair point. If we have the <clears throat> constitutional authority to order continued funding for core functions, what I'm really trying to get at is, do you think the judiciary has the authority to order the governor to call an unconditioned special session? I do not. Co I think Council. that would be an invasion of the executive, uh, executive's power, and the court would not have that power. Council, I want to ask you about the uh, line item veto uh, authority, and I want to look to Madison's reference in Federalist 51 that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. I want to presume, I, I presume here for purposes of this question, that this governor um, exercised his veto for exactly the reason that he suggested, and that he wants further negotiations. But let me ask you about some future governor who during the legislative session, line item vetoes the legislature. He simply doesn't want them to meet. He or she simply doesn't want them to meet. And he or she is not interested in further negotiations. In other words, um, you can argue about whether or not this is hyperbole here, but that's not hyperbole. That is abolishing the legislature. Is that line item veto appropriate? Is it constitutional, I should say? <clears throat> Your case of Lee versus Delmont has this statement. Power is not judged by the ability of someone to abuse it. It's judged by the nature of the power. Your example might be something like Brown versus Board of Education. When does the judiciary get pushed so far by legislative executive action that it's got to step in to resolve a situation? If your hypothetical were true that a governor line item the legislature to, with the intent of putting it out of business permanently, the crisis uh, uh, then perhaps the court could step in. Justice Anderson's but hypothetical, not, though, assumes that the legislature would not be in a position to override the veto, correct? It does, and they would have the they override can do that. ability. They can do that if they assemble two-thirds majority, right? It isn't too hard, though, just to respond to that question, it isn't too hard to think of uh, a situation wherein uh, a minority in the legislature of either party or of no party would say, I'm, we're perfectly happy with the legislature not meeting. And then you have the crisis that I've just asked the question about. I think, Your Honor, the case that is in front of you is difficult enough, <laughs> important enough, involves high stakes, that I would not waste a lot of time thinking about all of the possibilities. There, sure, there are endless possibilities. Somebody said uh, democracy is the worst form of government except every other one that's been tried. 
That would be Churchill. But I don't know if he was the first. The, uh, this is a beautiful process. It works. It works especially in Minnesota. It has always worked. It's worked for hundreds of years. It's working now, even though there are bitter disputes. But the process is governed by the Constitution. There was questions about the textual provision of the Constitution. There's nothing in Article uh, uh, 4, Section 23 that limits the right of a line item veto except that it must be an item of appropriation. This court isn't at liberty to imply other limits. Whether you look back at history, you can construe the Constitution, but that means you construe the words in the Constitution. You don't add words to it. There's no ambiguity in that clause. It's very clear there is only one limitation. Johnson said, even though it was only one sentence, it was a beautiful sentence. Once we decide it's an item of an appropriation, our inquiry is over. The judicial inquiry is over. But certainly, there's still the Constitution. <coughs> I mean, the Constitution still sets the bookends, even if there's a specific provision. So, so if if I mean, you you could spin out a hypothetical where the the line item veto was absolutely unconstitutional under another provision in the Constitution, equal protection. I mean, the judiciary would certainly have to step in in that scenario. I could, I suppose, one could imagine such a scenario, but it's not present here. I understand that, but we do have an obligation to figure out how the rule of law that we write here will I, be applied or, or abused in the future. But I think the political question doctrine limits your jurisdiction somewhat that if you can't articulate a judicially manageable standard that can be applied to all cases as to where the limitation of the line item veto would be, then you're, you're wandering into the executive power, and I think the political question doctrine would say you don't have jurisdiction to go there. The legislature has not articulated a standard. Well, they would say the standard they've articulated is you can't use a line item veto to effectively eliminate the legislative function. And if that were the result of this line item veto, they would have a good argument. It is not. Now, counsel was asked about, uh, was there an assumption that the governor would not, in the agreement, the governor would not veto the bills? If that had been the assumption of the legislature, why the poison pill? The poison pill was put into the, ta into the appropriations bill to prevent the exercise of the veto of the tax bill. But counsel, uh, I, I think Mr. Kelly said to me when he and I were discussing that issue, the governor could have just vetoed the appropriation bill. What's your response to that? He could have vetoed the appropriation bill. It's where I started the argument, I think, earlier this morning. He had three options. He could veto the appropriation bill in full, he could veto the tax bill, or he could do the more precise, surgical, non-blunt process of, veto of line item vetoing the legislature. Had he vetoed the entire appropriations bill, he would have uh, potentially put out of work 19,000 state employees. He had gone through that process in 2011. He had no appetite to do it. He was looking for what is the least disruptive measure I can use among the toolkit I have from the Constitution to bring the legislature back, not to discuss the hundreds of items that were in those 10 omnibus bills, but to discuss five items that I have serious disagreement with it because I think they're going to adversely affect the citizens of Minnesota. They're going to adversely affect the stability of our fiscal situation. They're going to put us back into the uh, fiscal uh, situation we were in before. Why can't he use that line item veto to do the least disruptive act to get the legislature back? It's not a permanent denial of appropriations. It's a negotiating tool in the middle of negotiations, not Council, at the end. there's no dispute in the record that when the governor exercised the line item veto, he knew that the legislature had already adjourned. Uh, I'm, I'm, I believe he did. Council, could uh, the governor have line item vetoed anything in the tax bill? 
he could not. And if he had, the five, if, if, he vetoed, five, yeah, if he vetoed the tax bill in its entirety, then he essentially would have involuntarily line item the revenue department in the state government appropriations bill. That would have been the indirect effect of, uh, because of the poison pill. He agreed with many things that were in the tax bill. To do a, a veto of the entire bill, he has to throw out the baby with the bathwater. He would have to throw out all of the benefits of the tax bill just to address three discrete issues that he wanted to renegotiate. And, and in, in the meantime, then he would have to uh, deny appropriations to the Revenue Department, which means if you're in a negotiating posture, what's the likelihood of reaching a political settlement? What is his po posture when the poison pill was designed to put him on the defensive, not to give him leverage? In other words, I veto the tax bill, let's come back and discuss, but I'm a little bit preoccupied. I've got to get funding for my revenue department. I've got 1,300 employees whose jobs are at stake. That poison pill not only uh, encroached upon his veto power, but it, prov it provided that if he did exercise the veto, he's gonna be in a very poor bargaining well, those position. those 1,300 employees actually collect the money. They keep the government running, yes. All of our discussion of funding wouldn't, would be academic if it weren't for the revenue department. Council, if we agreed with your position here today and, and held that uh, the line item veto was constitutional under both Article 3 and Article 4, Section 23, then the remedy that I understand you're seeking is we would uh, reverse Judge Guthman on that, that ruling. But as to counts two and three of the, the complaint, we would remand those to Judge Gutman for this core funding proceeding. Is that correct? That's correct, and that's what we requested. I'm gonna ask you to do a little impromptu drafting because as you might have been able to tell from some of the questions, there's at least a concern that I have and I think shared by some of my colleagues. What does that part, if, we're, if we agree with that and that's the opinion we're writing, what do we say? What's the rule of law that we articulate about this core funding. What do we tell Judge Guthman to do? Uh, and, and I'm hearing a little bit that maybe one thing we have to do is to distinguish between appropriations as such under Article 11, and which we don't have the authority to do, and we being the judicial branch, and core funding. So help me with, with some proposed language. What, what does that rule of law look like in your view? It would be hard to state in one sentence or one paragraph. I know. <laughs> in, in the three uh, core funding cases that were in front of Ramsey County, the, uh, I think then probably Department of Administration, now Management and Budget, using federal government shutdown criteria developed, and, it, and it's part, I believe, of, uh, uh, of an affidavit submitted in this case, several pages of criteria for how you determine what is core, how you determine what is critical. And so in, in I think as you look at each one of those core funding orders, <laughs> you will find the criteria in those cases. It, it doesn't equivalent, uh, it isn't equivalent to an appropriation. In the Lyon County case, for example, the court said that doesn't mean you get what you want. It only means you get what you need to stay functioning. Now, it's unusual Council, here because the legislature- Say more about that. How is, it, how is it distinct from an appropriation? Well, I think this court has had to go through the process itself for the judiciary. There are certain things that are desirable, but not absolutely necessary to perform your function. Counsel, is the rule of law you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you can get what you need? <laughs> that would be a good rule of law, I think. Any other questions? It's, it's somewhat unique here because the legislature does not publish a line item budget. It only has these two lines, Senate, House. Uh, and so it's difficult to say from an overview of, of, of their budget, which is truly essential, which is what you want, but not what you need. I think that would be the process that, that the court will have to go through.
Thank you, Council. Thanks to both Council for the help Thank that you provided to the court in this matter. This case is submitted. We'll issue an opinion in due course. We're in recess.